Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 426th episode, we're celebrating our eighth anniversary of the podcast. Yeah, because this month, January, is our eighth anniversary. I don't remember the exact date, so we're just going <laughs> with by the end of January, we'll have this episode celebrating. Yep, because we started way back in January 2015. Oh, Actually, when we started the podcast, we started making an effort to go to as many dinosaur museums as possible. Mm -hmm. We had already had our dinosaur museum map up on our website for a couple of years. And we were really thinking like, okay, yeah, we got to get serious. Let's get to the museums. So this week, we're going to be talking about all the best dinosaur museums in the world, partly to relive some of our favorite dinosaur road trips and trips to museums around the world. And we think that other people might want to try out. Mm -hmm. We also want to share some of our favorite smaller museums that you've probably never heard of, as well as some of the big museums that we haven't made it to yet, but we know are really amazing. Oh, and yeah. we would love it if we could make it there someday. There are many museums we still want to go to. There are a couple of continents we <laughs> still need yeah. to make it to. There so this is not a comprehensive list. No, it is not. I was going to say there are way more museums we want to go to than we have been to, but we've done a pretty good job of making it to a lot of the museums that were high on our list. Oh, yeah. So I don't know. We're, we're starting to get there. I do want to get it to like as many as possible, though. And we have over 300 museums on our map, and we haven't even been to close to half of those. No. So <laughs> we've got plenty of places to go still. We've got time. Yeah. Eight more years. Eight <laughs> more years. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We also, though, have a dinosaur of the day, and that is Haya. And I've got a fun fact, which really surprised me. It's about a famous fossil collector that I don't think anybody really realizes collected fossils. Since I know who this is about, I'm going to jump in and say I did know. But oh. you'll probably be telling me a lot of new things. <laughs> yeah, I went pretty deep down the rabbit hole. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons, and we have two new patrons to thank this week who joined at our Triceratops tier, so they're getting shout-outs, and they are David and Packy Selskisaurus. I really like Packy Selskisaurus, good combination of their name and a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And then rounding out our shout-outs, we've got Daniel McGill, Steve Ceratops, Ayrton and Everett, Diplodicate, Robert, JC, Ray, and McManosaurus. Thank you so much for supporting our show and celebrating our eight-year anniversary with us. Yep, we wouldn't have been able to make it to all these dinosaur museums without our patrons. So definitely a huge thank you to every one of our patrons. So on to the main event of all the dinosaur museums around the world. I guess they're technically natural history museums, but the museums that make it onto our map have a big dinosaur component to them. Yes, some of them are pretty much purely dinosaur museums. Actually, some of them are purely dinosaur museums and have basically no other animals in them. Although you're right, most of them have other natural history in them. In order to be on our map, basically what we say is they have to have a dinosaur on display, preferably a real fossil and not just a recreation of one. But if they do have recreations and their intent is to teach people about the dinosaurs by using the recreations, that's fine too. Yeah. And thank you to our listeners too, who have helped us add museums to the map. Yes. Yeah. A lot of probably at least a third of the museums on the map came from listeners. So mm -hmm. Thank you very much. What we're going to talk about in this episode is not an exhaustive list. They're mostly big museums, but again, some of the small ones that we really enjoyed. I will say there is an expression in photography that's the best camera is the one that's with you. And I think the same thing applies to dinosaur museums. Whichever museum is local to you or around when you're traveling, it's also fun to check the map. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth visiting all of them because they're all interesting. They're all unique. Mm -hmm. And especially if they're near a specific formation and they have dinosaurs from that formation, you can learn a ton of really cool detailed stuff about the place you are and what it was like millions of years ago, which is always really fun to do. Yeah. And I'll say we've taken trips where we're specifically going to see dinosaur sites and museums, but sometimes we're going somewhere for an unrelated reason. Yeah, like a wedding or something. Yeah. And you look up like, oh, what 
dinosaur museums are around, and that's a great way to get to know a new city. Yes, and again, that was the origin of Ino Dino was our museum map because mostly for ourselves, we were trying to keep track of where all these dinosaur museums were, so that when we traveled, we could figure out what the closest dinosaur museum was. And we launched that ten years ago, and that's on inodino.com/slash-dinosaur-museums or you can just go to the regular thing and click on museums. Go to inodino.com and then in the nav, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just to be a little more specific than the thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, we have to start with I'm hesitant to say favorite because we have there's so many good ones, but this is probably our favorite. It's my favorite. And it's for our favorite for a lot of reasons. The AMNH, American Museum of Natural History in New York, and we have a personal connection to it because That's how we rediscovered our love of dinosaurs as adults and what led to us starting the museum map and the blog and eventually the podcast. Yes. And having the dinosaur-themed wedding so we can attribute it all to AM&H. And it's, you know, in addition to this personal connection, it's just a really great museum. Mm -hmm. You could spend so much time in there. In fact, anytime someone came to visit us when we were living nearby on the East Coast, we'd say, hey, how about a trip to the (laughs) (laughs) AM&H? Yes. Yeah, and there's about 100 specimens on display. They've got the Hall of Ornithischian Dinosaurs and the Hall of Sauruschian Dinosaurs. About 85% of those specim- or those fossils that are on display are fossils. Mm-hmm. Or at least have fossils in them. And the rest is cast. So 85% is fossils, 15% is cast. Pretty cool ratio. Yeah, that is a lot. I really like the Patagotitan, which we did get to see... I forget, a few years ago. It's that 122 feet long. It's been there since 2016. And the head and the neck extend out toward the elevator because it doesn't fit in the room. It's so big. Yeah, that was when we were there for a wedding, like we were saying. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And then we're like, might as well go to the AM&H. Well, we're here. We got to go see Patago Titan. (laughs) I forgot that's why we were there. They also, if I'm not mistaken, have the holotype of Ankylosaurus there. Or at Mm. least if it's not the holotype, it's a really great tail club. Mm Mm-hmm. And you've got the rearing Barasaurus. There's, of course, T-Rex, which might be one of the most well-known T-Rex displays. It's the T-Rex that the Jurassic Park logo is based on. So I think it is the best known T-Rex, even if people don't realize that's the T-Rex. <laughs> that's the best known. Yeah. And they also have temporary exhibits. I remember one time we saw one. It was all about sauropods. And there was that display to show how... It could breathe with such a long neck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the am and creates a fair number of those exhibits and then sort of sends them out into other places. They put one on a bus at one point, mm-hmm. drove it around <laughs> the tri-state area yeah. kind of thing. So Yeah, then of course they've got researchers, they do expeditions, lots going on over there. They've got tons of Mongolia and stuff mm-hmm. because I think Roy Chapman Andrews was affiliated with AM&H when oh, he yeah. went over there. So they've got all his like Velociraptor, Oviraptor eggs and all sorts of stuff. So it's, I mean, AM&H doesn't need any people telling everybody to go there, but yeah. that's, if you're in New York, you have to go to AM&H. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a question. <laughs> So for the other museums, we're sort of breaking it down by region. So I'm going with east of the Mississippi for some other great dinosaur museums in the U.S. The next one, I would say, after AM&H, there are several contenders, but I think maybe the next one that's at the top of the list is the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. And we're saying that before we've even seen the uh, (laughs) deep time (laughs) exhibit. The recreation, yeah, Yeah. since it reopened. So there are a lot of Smithsonian museums in Washington, D.C., and all the Smithsonian museums are free. AM&H used to be technically free for everyone, although they strongly encourage the suggested donation, and you can't really tell that it's a suggested donation by looking at the pricing, but you could go up to the front desk and say, I'm going to pay zero dollars, please give me an admission ticket, and they would do that and Mm. let you in. But now they changed it right after COVID. So the suggested donation part only applies to people in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Mm. So you can still do that if you're from one of those places and you have an ID to prove it. But otherwise, you have to pay their suggested price, which I think is like $25 for the main entry. Mm -hmm. And that's all you get access to if you do a different suggested donation. You won't get into any special exhibits or the planetarium, for example. But all the dinosaurs, unless there's a special exhibit on dinosaurs, are in the main exhibit. That's where Patago Titan and T-Rex and all that stuff is. They have an amazing collection in Smithsonian. 
back to Smithsonian. <laughs> All right. <laughs> couldn't help getting back to David H. <laughs> since they own a lot of fossils that were discovered on federal lands, since it's the National Museum, mm-hmm. if it's a nationally owned fossil, basically, a lot of it ends up there. That's why it's called the Nation's T-Rex. Yes. So that's their star of the show is the Nation's T-Rex, aka Wankel Rex. That's what it was called back when it was on loan to MOR for a couple decades and on display there. And that's an 85% complete T-Rex, probably twice as complete as the one at AMH. The Nation's T-Rex is chewing on Hatcher, the Triceratops. Oh, yeah. They <laughs> they changed Hatcher's position. Yes. So it used to just be standing on its own. Now it's getting chewed on and chewed on its frill. And Hatcher is a composite made up of multiple individuals. I believe it's purely replica bones, unlike the Nation's T-Rex, which is biting its frill. But I think the skull of Nation's T-Rex is probably a replica in the mount, Mm. I would guess, because that's what they usually do for T-Rex, because it's hard to mount the skulls. Skulls are really heavy. Yes, and fragile. We haven't, like you said, been there since the remodel, but we have seen videos and it looks really great. It seems like the focus is mostly on the Hell Creek in a section called the Last American Dinosaurs. But there is a full hadrosaur mount and I think a small pachycephalosaur. I can't quite tell from the pictures. And it looks like some Morrison sauropods there as well. So they got some Jurassic stuff in the mix. And yeah, it just looks great. The main reason I put it in second place is because it's free. Mm. (laughs) So it's very accessible and it just recently got remodeled. So I think it's definitely worth going to see. Mm -hmm. It's on our list. And it's a popular tourist spot, Washington, D.C. too. Mm -hmm. So there's a decent chance you'll be nearby at some point. Next up, these aren't really in a particular order anymore, are the Yale Peabody Museum in New Haven, Connecticut. Which is also on our list to still go. Yeah, somehow we missed that when we lived on the East Coast. Mm. I don't know why or how, but we didn't know. Forgive us. We hadn't started the podcast yet, (laughs) so we weren't thinking of that. (laughs) Yeah, it was founded by George Peabody after his nephew, O.C. Marsh, requested the founding of a museum there and the big donation by his uncle. During the Bone Wars, Marsh filled the museum with tons of excellent fossils. For the record, most of Cope's fossils are at AMH. Just keep bringing up AMH. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, if you're thinking Bone Wars, like where did all those fossils go? Cope went to AMH, Marsh went to Yale Peabody. So if you're thinking of these cool things in the West and mm-hmm. all the big name dinosaurs, that's where a lot of them are. New York and Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And New Haven is very close to Manhattan. You can get there on a, maybe an hour or two train ride. In the Peabody collection, some of the highlights are the mounted holotype of Brontosaurus, or Apatosaurus, if you don't go along with the new naming. Apatosaurus excelsus. Yeah. (laughs) I just did another quick search, and I think Brontosaurus is still considered valid by pretty much everyone, at least in the peer review literature. Right. But then we hear some talks that uh, maybe not, and it's kind of like how we hear about Dakota Raptor. Yes. But I couldn't find any peer-reviewed articles since 2015 that reference the shop at all paper saying that it doesn't deserve to be its own genus anymore. So it's one of those sort of put up or shut up oh. <laughs> things where you got to put your money where your mouth is and publish. Getting aggressive here. <laughs> I'm just trying to defend Brontosaurus for you. <laughs> <laughs> People talk trash, but unless it's published, mm. you know, it's all just words. The Peabody Museum also has the hugely influential 110-foot mural by Zallinger above the mounted skeletons. I really want to see that. It's countless dinosaur toys and all sorts of stuff are based on this mural. Super important. And we talked about with Mariana De Giacomo in episode 338 how the museum is closed and undergoing major renovations, but they had to build a special area around that mural to make sure it didn't get dust on it and stayed in pristine condition. I think it'll be reopening relatively soon. I think so too. Hopefully, because it will be really cool and they're adding a whole bunch of stuff to it. Mm -hmm. Next up on our list, we've got the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's another one we need to see. Yeah, we missed that one when we were in (laughs) Pittsburgh. (laughs) Although I think at that point we were driving a moving truck, towing a car and stuff. So it would have been kind of tricky to drive to a museum. Yeah. But the original mounted Diplodocus named Dippy is there. Mm -hmm. And that is a reminder that the Dippy in England is actually a cast replica of the original, which is in Pittsburgh. And Dippy's an amalgamation. Yes, that's true too. I think there's two different Diplodocus that make up its body. Maybe there's other ones that were included as replica bones, but I think the one that's mounted in the Carnegie Museum is 
mostly one, and then part of the tail is from a different one, if I remember right. They also have a lot of other Jurassic Morrison formation stuff, including other sauropods. And that's why Dinosaur National Monument has the quote unquote Carnegie Quarry. Mm -hmm. It's no coincidence. <laughs> a lot of the stuff went from Dinosaur National Monument in Utah slash Colorado back to Pittsburgh. They also have a juvenile Apatosaurus and they have the holotype of T-Rex. That's CM9380, which used to be AM&H 973. That was before being moved during World War II. We mm -hmm. talked about that in a fun fact at one point. We did. And also one of our listeners, Taylor McCoy, wrote an article about it on our blog. If you want to get into all the details. Yes. But you shouldn't feel too bad for AM&H because they have AM&H 5027, which is much more complete at 45% versus just 10% for mm -hmm. the holotype. Yep. And like you said, that's the one that's on display and also is the Jurassic Park logo inspiration, the one at am &H. Then we've also got the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Which we have been to. We have. It's claimed to be the oldest natural history museum in the Americas. And I believe it because it was founded in 1812, which was 30 years before the name dinosaur existed. Mm -hmm. And before most of the universities existed <laughs> in the U.S., especially the ones that focus on paleontology. It also is about 80 years before Drexel was founded, but they're now closely linked. It used to just be called the Academy of Natural Sciences, and it had another name even before that yeah. that it was associated with. I think Cope was associated with them, too, at one point. There are a lot of famous people that were associated because Philadelphia was sort of the center of a whole lot of stuff in the U.S. back then. And they've got that hadrosaurus. Yeah, they have Hattie the Hadrosaurus that was found in Haddonfield, New Jersey, just across the river from Philadelphia. Which you can still go to that site. There's a plaque. And it's really interesting because it's just on a cul-de-sac of a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But if you want to see the bones that came out of it, you got to go to the Academy of Natural Sciences. Mm -hmm. And that was the first museum anywhere in the world to ever be mounted for display in that museum. I think it might have been in a different building, but still technically the same institution. And they have a couple of versions of Hattie still on display, one with just basically a recreation of the bones, the original bones that they have. So you can see just how fragmentary it was. And then they, of course, have the full skeletal mount. And then there are statues around two of Hattie. They also have the Thomas Jefferson fossil collection. More on that in the fun fact. Spoiler. Now you know who it's about. Yeah. <laughs> and they have a few other nice dinosaur mounts, but there's a lot of cool stuff in there. And that's one that a lot of people miss because there's so much other stuff to do in Philadelphia with the Art Museum and Liberty Bell and whatever. Really, you got to make sure you go to the Drexel Academy of Natural Sciences because they have some really cool dinosaur stuff. Making it farther west, but still east of the Mississippi. There's the Field Museum in Chicago, Illinois. Another one, sadly, we haven't <laughs> made it to yet. No, I think I might have gone as a kid because growing up in Milwaukee is pretty nearby. Mm, makes sense. The Field Museum has a new updated display of Sioux, which includes a lifelike model as well as the original skeleton. This is another one where you don't want to miss the skull of Sue, which is on the ground next to the full skeletal mount, which has a skull replica. Yep, heavy skulls. And the Field Museum also recently got Maximo, as they call it, the Titanosaur, which is a replica of Patagotitan, which is basically the same as the one they have at AM&H. Mm -hmm. Then there's the Cleveland Museum of Natural History in Ohio. The big thing there is the holotype of Nanotyrannus, or as most people consider it, a juvenile Tyrannosaurus skull. But either way, it's still a really cool and important fossil. And, in, and to go along with that skull, they have a replica of Jane, another juvenile Tyrannosaurus slash Nanotyrannus, depending on who you ask. So you can see sort of what it might have looked like with the rest of its body attached. Mm -hmm. Just how much did it look like Tyrannosaurus? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> There's also the holotype of the sauropod Haplocanthosaurus, which is nicknamed Happy. I think Happy is getting a makeover. So that'll be something cool to see. Yeah. They also have a very complete Coelophysis, which is mounted, and a partial Allosaurus and other ubiquitous large dinosaur replica mounts. And then last is one that's an up-and-coming dinosaur museum, and that's the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Well, it's been around for a long time. 
Yeah, but when we visited, they had some cool dinosaur sculptures and maybe a couple of skeletons on display. But starting supposedly, hopefully in 2023, they're going to have a giant new lab, which is going to showcase the dueling dinosaurs. Oh, that's really cool. Which is maybe the coolest dinosaur fossil site ever found. It's truly astonishing. It's a T-Rex battling a triceratops, fossilized together, articulated. It might be the most complete T-Rex ever found and the most complete triceratops ever found together in one combo. We won't know until it's fully prepared, which will take a long time, but it's cool. Yeah, that's why they're making this new lab is because they need a lot more space for it because it's a massive thing and they want to be able to show it off with the public while they're doing it, just like they did with Sue the T-Rex down in Disney World Mm -hmm. (laughs) when they were prepping it. And there are rumors that the dueling dinosaurs have skin impressions, gut contents, and maybe some useful chemical signatures as well. So yeah, it has the potential to be probably the most important, maybe after Archaeopteryx or something, but certainly one of the most important fossils ever found. Show us the guts. Yeah. (laughs) And up next is what has been called the Dinosaur Mecca (laughs) Museum. We've heard it referred to as like every dinosaur enthusiast needs to make it to this museum. But first, we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break. And now moving much further west, but also north, (laughs) because we're in Canada now, is the Royal Tyrol Museum, which we got to visit twice, actually. Yeah. Once on a road trip, we took a road trip around Montana and Alberta and got to see was four museums in a week. It was pretty awesome. I think one of my favorite parts of the Royal Tyrol is Black Beauty, which is the Tyrannosaur. Another Tyrannosaur where you got to look for the skull on the side because the skull is too heavy. Yes. As a Tyrannosaurus <laughs> Rex. Yes. For clarification, because they have several other Tyrannosaurs there too. Good point. Good point. And Black Beauty is that it, the fossils are this gorgeous obsidian, and it's mounted up there in the death pose, just really majestic. Not literally obsidian, but yes. Yeah, co- the color. <laughs> just to be pedantic. <laughs> It'd be amazing if there was a dinosaur fossil that was actually obsidian. It would be. And then there's, speaking of other theropods, you've got the Gorgosaurus in the death pose. And then, of course, Boreal Pelta. Yes. Yeah, that... Uh, is maybe my favorite. Borealopelta and Zool are the two coolest by far ankylosaurs and maybe some of the coolest dinosaur finds, period. Yeah, and if I'm remembering correctly, I, I remember reading that Borealopelta, the way that they mounted it for the display is so that you could be at eye level with it, or at least maybe kids could be at eye level yes, with it. I think for kids, yeah. Yeah. You can get down there. Like I sat down next to it so I could see it more clearly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you can get all the way around it because they mounted it in the middle of the room with a little bit of glass around it. Yeah. And they made a cool sort of metal lattice thing with it so they could put the couple little pieces of it where they belong because they didn't want to prep too much on it since it's a fossilized mummy type thing with all the keratin and skin yeah, but details. Yeah, you, you can see all those details. Yeah, it's beautiful. It is. Then there's their fossils in focus area because they've got a really large research collection, so it rotates what they've got on display. And when we went, we saw that Regaliceratops skull, which was really cool. Yeah, with all the frill details and everything. And then there's the dinosaur hall. There's a lot of skeletons like Triceratops, Camarasaurus, T-Rex. And there's the Cretaceous Alberta area where they've got Albertosaurus. It's a bunch of life-size replicas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are fun to take pictures with. Yep, it's sort of a gross series. They've got like a juvenile scrappy one and a much larger, (laughs) more fearsome looking one. And then, of course, they've got their own prep lab. So it's in Drumheller, which is also a really cool city to visit because Drumheller is basically a dinosaur town. You can find dinosaur sculptures everywhere. Yeah, they got yarn bombed we talked about one time. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, at the Royal Tyrol. It's a major part of that city. And yeah, I think that's partly why people think of it as a huge dinosaur destination because some of the hotels are dinosaur themed. Mm -hmm. You got the dinosaur sculptures in the town. You've got that big dinosaur that you can climb up. Oh yeah, the T-Rex you go up into its mouth. Mm -hmm. And then the museum itself is just, it's almost all dinosaur stuff. It was built there because it's right next to a huge 
formation with tons of dinosaur fossils in it. And so that was always the intention. Like, let's have a huge fossil exhibit hall as well as a huge, their prep lab is amazing. It's got like cranes and stuff in it Mm -hmm. so that they can have these huge fossils and deal with massive weight and all that stuff. So yeah, it's amazing. Definitely worth visiting. Oh yeah. But you would probably go there for the sake of that museum. There's not a lot else to do in Drumheller, or no. <laughs> what else are you going to do? Dinosaurs, come on. Yep. <laughs> of course, we have to call out a few other museums in Canada, starting with the Philip J. Curry Museum, which is also in Alberta, but much further north. Yeah, up in Grand Prairie. I think it was like an eight-hour drive for us from Drumheller to Grand Prairie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking from our place, it was a lot farther to get to <laughs> Oh no, but <laughs> the like if, you were, if you were going to go, if you had enough time and to explore Alberta, then you might as well see both of these museums. Yeah. I mean, you can get to Drumheller a lot easier, though, because I think it's only about an hour from Calgary. Oh, yeah. Whereas the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum is way up there. True. I think they have a small airport, but it, you pretty much need to drive. And when we drove up there, it was in August, and it had snowed maybe two weeks before. Mm-hmm. It was so <laughs> it's quite far north. It is. It is. <laughs> but that was the main reason we did that dinosaur road trip was because we wanted to see this new museum. Which, oh, yeah, because it had just opened like that year or maybe the year before we yep. went. And then we tied in a dinosaur dig and then stopped at a few other dinosaur museums along the way, too. It was a great trip. It was. Yeah, the Curry Museum, it's not the easiest to get to, but it's worth it if you can because... I mean, they know. They know they're remote. So they have all these things in their exhibit to interact with, but they also have set up ways to be like a satellite museum in some ways. So you can still kind of experience what they have. I really liked their AR. Like, for example, you could see an animated dinosaur next to the skeleton. Yeah, you point like an iPad at the skeleton and then you see it sort of come to life. Yeah. There's also this area of tracks that you can get really close to, like you can pop up from the ground and then I mean you're you're kind of covered but you could be eye level with the tracks. That was fun. So yeah, definitely worth seeing if you can. Heading back east, still in Canada, there's the Royal Ontario Museum, the ROM, which we've also gotten a chance to visit twice and I think we got to visit both times it was for like a nightlife kind of event. Yeah. Because the last one was the welcome reception for SVP. And then another time they do these like weekly or monthly nightlife things, which is fun. Yeah, where you can go as an adult. And I think they might serve alcohol. Yeah, there's at least food. And you can walk around checking out all the exhibits after hours. They've got an age of dinosaur galleries with a complete barosaurus. Apparently, that Barosaurus is nicknamed Gordo. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. That's fun. <laughs> and they've got a bunch of hadrosaur skulls on display, and hadrosaurs in general, and triceratops. There's T-Rex. There's a Quetzalcoatlus that's hanging from the ceiling. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Well, the Parasaurolophus, especially, talking about hadrosaurs, that's where the holotype is. Mm-hmm. So that is beautiful. And they have a, a replica out on the floor that you can see. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the Dawn of Life gallery that opened up fairly recently. And you can see nearly a thousand fossil specimens on display, and it goes all the way back to four billion years ago. Yeah, that is a very good museum. And they are the museum that has Zool, although I don't think it's currently on display there. It's in their collections. Yeah. And Zool is great. (laughs) <laughs> and they're not that far from Research Casting International, which makes a bunch of the, <laughs> the casts that go into these museums. Yep. And they also have their own little display area. Okay, also in Canada is the Royal Saskatchewan Museum, which we haven't been to yet, but it's home to Scotty, the world's largest T-Rex. Scotty was found in Saskatchewan. Then is 65% complete. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty awesome. They've got their Earth Sciences Gallery, and they've, there's dinosaurs from the Cretaceous. So you've got your T-Rex and Triceratops and Edmontosaurus, and they've got this half-size robotic T-Rex known as Mega Munch. Hmm. <laughs> it sounds fun. But yeah, I'd like to see Scotty at some point. Yeah. 65% complete is amazing, too. Yeah. Yeah, it's on, definitely on the more complete end for uh, a Tyrannosaurus, especially. All right, after the, the Canadian interlude, now we've got the Western U.S., 
starting with the Montana Dinosaur Trail. Yeah, there's 14 stops if you want to go on the full trail. Wow, they're up to 14. It's grown. It's really fun because they're mostly off the beaten path, so you can make a really fun road trip out of it, doing a big loop. Most of the museums have touch bones, which are usually like a big sauropod femur or something similar that is massive and you can stand next to it and basically like hug it if you want to, (laughs) which is really cool. And they don't do that in the bigger museums because they would get so nasty with all the people touching them, Mm. potentially damaged and stuff. But in these smaller museums, they get fewer visitors. They can do cool stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. it's definitely fun to do. And you can get a passport, as they call it, for a few dollars. And then you get it stamped at each museum along the way. And if you go to all the museums and you show it to them, they'll give you a t-shirt. You just have to do it within five years. So I think ours has expired. It has. So we'd have to start over again. But the only ones we've been to are all pretty close and on the Western side by the biggest airport. So it's pretty easy to go to those. (laughs) We Mm -hmm. went to the easy ones so far, basically. The biggest stop on the dinosaur trail by far is the Museum of the Rockies. They have tons of Tyrannosaurus specimens, including a really cool series of skulls. Oh, where you yeah. can see a sort of a range of size. They're all pretty adult size, but some of them are really massive. There's the same story with Triceratops, tons of Triceratops. They range from a really tiny little basically hatchling all the way up to a massive Taurosaurus or an adult Triceratops, if you agree with John Scanella. <laughs> it's labeled as Triceratops at the MOR. Yeah. When we interviewed him there, we said, oh, I see you have a Taurosaurus at the end. And he goes, you mean an adult Triceratops? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they also have a Rictodromeus or a Rictodromeus since Dave Riccio works there. Oh, yeah. And I like their display too, because it's one of those where um, it's a life-size replica and one half is the skeleton and the other half is what it would look like with flesh. Yep. And they, I think they have something showing the burrow as well. Mm-hmm. And they also have the same sort of half flesh, half feathers for a raptor that's there, which is really cool. And lots of other stuff. It's a really good museum. The other one we've been to on the stop is the Montana Dinosaur Center, formerly the Two Medicine Dinosaur Center because it's in the Two Medicine Formation. Mm-hmm. And that's where we did our dig. It is. They also have a Seismosaurus replica curled up in their museum. Oh, yeah, because it <laughs> it doesn't big. fit. Yeah. <laughs> and there's lots of interesting fossils on display that were found within just a few miles of the museum because the museum is pretty close to Egg Mountain where Myasaura was discovered. And there's also like a lot of Troodon stuff around. They also have a Pachycephalosaur and yeah, lots of eggs. Mm-hmm. So it's a cool museum. And it's a it, it's when you're driving, you see the museum from a distance because there's not a lot else in the way. Mm -hmm. And they have this big painting on the side of it that shows this little kid next to a big bone. (laughs) Yeah, then you know you're in the right place. I've actually been there twice because I stopped there on a different road trip without Sabrina one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you were bragging about that road trip for years, so (laughs) we had to do our own. Yep. There's also Carter County Museum in Ekalaka. That has a mount of a nearly complete anatotitan, as they call it. It's usually called a Montosaurus. They also have a complete Triceratops skull. But maybe more importantly is they have their annual dino shindig in the summer, which is on our bucket list yes. of things to go to. We haven't been to the museum yet. There's also, like Sabrina said, 14 total museums. So that means there's like 10 more on the list. 11. 11. <laughs> and not on the dinosaur trail, but in nearby North Dakota. There's the North Dakota Heritage and State Museum in Bismarck, which has Dakota, the amazing juvenile Edmontosaurus mummy, with that degloved arm that I keep talking about. Mm. But in general, it has all sorts of skin and really cool preservation. So I think if you're in Montana and you're not going to be in that neck of the woods for a long time and you're driving all around the state, if you could make it over to North Dakota, that might be a good thing to swing by if you could. And there's also places in South Dakota where... <laughs> Unfortunately, not able to talk about all of the museums. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a long episode as it is. Yeah. But yeah, you, I, you can check out our museum map, see what's near where you'll be. Okay, continuing in the Western United States, but just going south a little bit. Of course, we have to talk about Utah. Yes. <laughs> I, there's a lot in Colorado too, but for this episode, at least we'll focus on Utah. Starting with the Dinosaur National Monument, which... Technically spans Colorado and Utah, but our favorite part, or my favorite part anyway, is the Cory Exhibit Hall, which is on the Utah side. Mm -hmm. 
And that's got over 1,500 dinosaur fossils on the cliff face. Yes. And it's, yeah, it's just so, I love seeing the vertical fossils. Yeah, it's just a wall of nothing but dinosaur fossils, basically. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. There, You can touch one. It's off to the side of the wall. Well, one of the dinosaurs that was really easy for me to spot is the Camarasaurus mm-hmm. in the wall. You can see its head and the several vertebrae of the neck leading up to the head. Yeah. And these fossils, they were first found in 1909, so it's cool that they're still in situ. Yes. Yeah, they built a big old lean-to type building around it to keep them just right in the rock. Yeah. It's amazing. And Dinosaur National Monument also has some really great hiking spots. There's a lot to do there if you're feeling outdoorsy. (laughs) Also in Utah is the Natural History Museum. There's a lot of cool stuff to see there. Some of the highlights, there's the Wall of Ceratopsian Skulls. I think that's in Salt Lake City, right? Yes. And they also have the Cleveland Lloyd Mystery Exhibit where, you know, there's a lot of animals that got stuck in the mud and they died, including a lot of Allosaurus specimens. So the mystery is, what happened here? (laughs) Yeah, why are there so many Allosaurus? It's like 80% Allosaurus bones. Yeah. Was it a predator trap? Did they die in a drought? Was there toxic water? It's really unclear what happened. And the museum also has a whole gallery room of dinosaurs. You can see things like Gryposaurus and Allosaurus. So it's a lot of fun to walk around. Yeah. I think my favorite thing is what you mentioned, the Ceratopsian skull wall, Mm -hmm. which is put up like a big cladogram so you can see how the skulls evolved into different shapes and crazy points and (laughs) spikes and everything. Yeah. And then near the Natural History Museum, which we found out after we had visited the Natural History Museum in Salt Lake City, is Thanksgiving Point. Apparently, it's like a half-hour drive away. (laughs) (laughs) Oops. Oops. uh, Well, I'll just have to go back sometime. They had the Utah Raptor block for about five years there while they were preparing it, which is cool. But the Utah Raptor block got relocated in 2020 to the Utah Core Research Center. I saw on the website, though, Thanksgiving Point has at least some skeletons on display, including a couple T-Rex, so it looks like a cool space. Yeah, Utah is a great place for dinosaur paleontology, for sure. Mm -hmm. So is, I think, Colorado, but we just don't have time to talk about everything. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So going farther west, we got to talk about California because that's where we're at. The best dinosaur museum in California, I begrudgingly think I have to say, is the LA Natural History Museum. Why begrudgingly? Because we're up in the Bay Area, so the the NorCal-SoCal rivalry. I see. (laughs) But yeah, it's a really good museum. They have a growth series of T-Rex, which is really cool. They also have T-Rex fighting a Triceratops in their atrium way before they did it at the Smithsonian. (laughs) There's Augustinolophus, which is California's state dinosaur. Yep. You got to go upstairs to see that one, though. Yeah. So when you're in the dinosaur gallery, there's a stairwell and make sure that you go up that stairwell and get to Augustinolophus. There's other cool stuff up there, too. Mm -hmm. So and you get to see all the mounted stuff from above, which is fun to do. They also have a bunch of dinosaur mounts and a guy wearing a giant wearable T-Rex puppet a lot of the time. I think they put on a regular show. Yeah. And the puppet is feathered. Yep. Yeah, I think they updated since we were there too. Mm. It looks really cool. So that's definitely one to not miss if you're in LA. It's pretty much downtown, so it's easy to get to. The San Diego Museum of Natural History is a close second. It has the Ankylosaur Alitopelta on display, (laughs) which is a really cool one. And it's Not nearly as nice as Zool, but it's sort of a similar thing where it's a big flat thing with all the osteoderms in it. And you can see some of the detail of what its armor looked like. They also have a cool metal version of Alito Pelta on display, which I think you can touch and maybe even sit on. I'm not sure if you could sit on it. Probably not. But it's really cool. And they have a Lambiosaurus and Albertosaurus mount that are half skeleton and half fleshed out sculpture that we always like to see. So Mm -hmm. you can get that interpretation of what it looked like when it was actually alive. And they also have this really funny diorama of a dead or dying troodon being eaten by opossums. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Which is pretty fun. (laughs) There's also some smaller museums that we really like in California, like the ALF Museum in Claremont, California. That one's on a high school campus and has uh, the holotype of Gryposaurus, which is a big hadrosaur. And there's the Western Science Center in Hemet, California, which has a growing collection of dinosaurs, largely from the Menifee Formation in New Mexico, including a few recently named holotypes. So, yeah, some cool stuff going on down there. Unfortunately, in Northern California, we don't have any museums with public exhibition space. 
And then last but not least on the West Coast, we've got the Burke Museum in Seattle, Washington. And as they put it, you can, quote, see the only real dinosaur fossils on display in Washington state, end quote. Interesting. And I also think there isn't anything in Oregon, so probably in the whole Pacific Northwest of America. We have a couple of museums on our map in Oregon. Oh, we do? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I take it back. <laughs> they have a really great T-Rex skull known as the Tufts Love T-Rex, and they have a couple of skeletal mounts as well as the potential state dinosaur, Sushasaurus rex, which is fine. <laughs> I'm fine with it. You're not a fan. <laughs> it's okay. You've accepted I it. I really don't like the name. It's but fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it gets people to pay attention to dinosaurs. That's what I keep telling myself. Mm. So moving much farther away, we've got Australia. There's a lot of those. There are. We also can't talk about all of them, but we did manage to visit a lot of them. We did. So a lot of them are on the Australia Dinosaur Trail. And the first one I'm going to mention is the Aramanga Natural History Museum in Aramanga, Queensland. That's what inspired us to go down the Australian Dinosaur Trail because they emailed us and invited us out there. They have a population of about 30 people in Aramanga. It is very deep out into the outback. They have no stores. They have one hotel and restaurant, which are both at the museum. <laughs> mm. It's my personal favorite of the museums on the Dinosaur Trail because they made us dinner on our anniversary, <laughs> which was very thoughtful. It was candlelit. They didn't know it was our anniversary. No, no. It just happened to work out that way. <laughs> they made us food because otherwise there was nowhere to get food. So we right. would have just been eating, you know, potato chips. It did take us most of the day to drive there. Yeah. It started out purely as a passion project by locals who found fossils because there's this really cool geology in the area where the fossils literally pop up out of the ground. They get like squeezed up during the dry and wet seasons. It's amazing and fascinating. So if you find a fossil on the surface, then you have to like dig down to see if there's anything below it, which is really interesting. And they have some of the largest sauropods found anywhere in the world, including Cooper, oh, yeah. the holotype of Astralotitan. They have a whole holotype room. There's so many holotypes. Yeah, you can go into their holotype room. It's a climate controlled storage room and they'll take you in there on the tour they also have Zach, which might be the most complete sauropod from Australia in their collections, which is also really awesome to see. Also on the Australian Dinosaur Trail, there's the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum in Winton, Queensland, which for a long time was basically the only thing out in the outback that had a big collections. Mm -hmm. They have several important holotype specimens, including Diamantinosaurus, nicknamed Matilda, Savannosaurus, nicknamed Wade. Australovenator, nicknamed Banjo. <laughs> yep. In Australia, I think all the specimens have nicknames. <laughs> they sure do. And you can see all of those holotypes in their holotype room as well. And they even have a little animation where you can see what the animals looked like walking around. They sort of have them get up and then the skeletons and then you see the, the flesh on them too, which is really cool. The museum is mostly outdoors, or at least the property is. So that holotype room is sort of in the main front building but then you can walk off or i think also get a shuttle to some of the other buildings including the fossil preparation building which has tons of unopened jackets and then also oftentimes people there working on preparing stuff mm -hmm. you can also go to the tracks from the luck quarry they have i think actual tracks they might be recreations but then they have sculptures of the potential track makers we were just talking about that and how they might not be right mm -hmm. if it turns out they're from herbivores rather than a carnivore. Right. And then the latest addition is the March of the Titanosaurs, mm -hmm. which is a building they finished in 2021 around a sauropod trackway, which is 55 meters or 180 feet long. That'd be cool to see. It, yeah, it's... <laughs> We missed it by just a couple years. Sauropod trackways are funny because it just looks like huge potholes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like there's no detail of the feet whatsoever. It's not like a theropod print where you can see the different toes and sometimes the claws. is just like a big old huge hole in the ground. But yeah, that one's definitely worth a visit if you're out in the outback. At that part of the outback, I should say. Then there's Dinosaur Stampede National Monument at Lark Quarry Conservation Park, which is a huge trackway that takes hours to get to on an extremely rough road. So we ended up skipping that one. But we saw a little bit of it, the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum. Mm -hmm. And the Flinders Discovery Center in Hewenden, which has a big mount of Mutaburosaurus. Those are the last two on the Australian Dinosaur Trail. Also known as Mutt. Yes. I think there's one more, but it doesn't actually have dinosaurs. So not getting into that. 
Not officially part of the trail is the Australian Opal Center, which is in Lightning Ridge, New South Wales. Oh, yeah. They have all the opalized fossils. It's so cool. Their description of it, I can't improve on, so I'm just going to read it. They say... At the Australian Opal Center, we have opalized dinosaur teeth, limb bones, backbones, toe bones, claws and pieces of rib, pelvis and shoulder. Most are in gray, black, or amber colored potch, but some shimmer with color. In some opal mines, you can even look up to see the underside of dinosaur footprints in the roof. That's awesome. It's just such a cool place because Lightning Ridge is basically an opal mining town, so there's all this opal mining stuff. But yeah, they sometimes have fossils that become opals there cool. and it's it's so cool. We got to see the collections and I was very lucky I was able to hold an a solid opal sauropod tooth which yeah. was amazing and I'm still amazed they let me hold it. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> the thing is priceless. And they should be starting construction on a new facility any day now. Currently it's in a really small inconspicuous downtown shop with a giant mural of dentures with opal inlays on yeah. the outside of it. So you'd never know inside there's all these opalized dinosaur fossils. It's just not big enough to display all the stuff they have to. Yeah, not even close. So hopefully they get that bigger building soon. I'm surprised they haven't started yet. Yeah, I think there are a lot of delays from COVID and everything mm -hmm. and funding. And then just real quick, New Zealand doesn't have a ton of dinosaur stuff, but the Auckland War Memorial Museum has a pair of T-Rex, at least for now, Peter and Barbara, which are both between 40 to 50% complete. So in New Zealand, that's worth seeing. Yep, we talked about them recently. So back to Australia, there are dinosaur museums outside of the dinosaur trail too. And three of them that we went to, there's the Queensland Museum, I'll talk about first. That's a cool space. They have this lost creatures exhibit. That's where they have their dinosaurs. Currently, it's closed for refurbishment until middle of this year. But they've got these tracks from the Seymour Quarry and there's a slab on display, and you can see a cool projection of the dinosaurs that they think made the tracks running across the slab. Mm -hmm. It's a large ornithopod, a small ornithopod, and a small theropod. These tracks from the Seymour Quarry are near the Lark Quarry. They were found in the 1960s, and the Seymour Quarry tracks led to finding the Lark Quarry. Oh, cool. Yeah. They've also got their own Mudaburosaurus. I think that's where the holotype is. Oh, I, I didn't remember that. And then when it reopens, when the exhibit reopens, they're going to have an Australovenador. Oh, cool. Yeah, they also have the little Minmi slash Kumbarasaurus and Kylosaur there too. Oh, yeah. Of course you would remember that. <laughs> 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 then there's the Melbourne Museum in Melbourne. That museum, it opened back in 1854. Must have been in a very different building though, because the new building is very modern. Yes, I think so. <laughs> and they've got millions of items in their collections, including holotypes of Deluva Cursor, Gallianosaurus, Atlas Cocosaurus, and Laelinosaura. Their Science and Life Gallery has lots of dinosaurs and megafauna replicas, including Tarbosaurus, Mementosaurus, the Amargosaurus I really like because it's rearing up and you can see it nicely from the second floor as yeah. well as the first floor. Yeah, that was cool. It's like peeking up at you. <laughs> and then a really cute protoceratops. They also have their 600 million years room, which is a little bit tucked away. It took us a while, maybe an embarrassingly long while <laughs> to find it. And the only reason we didn't miss it is because we knew it existed. <laughs> yeah, because where all the holotypes are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you, that's where you see all the holotypes. There's also an animatronic Quantosaurus. Yeah. So if you're trying not to miss it, when you go into the dinosaur hall, you turn right and it's <laughs> right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's probably something. I think we were just distracted by the large replicas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the last museum from Australia we want to mention is the Australian Museum. This is in Sydney. It's the oldest museum in the country. They have a lot of dinosaurs on display. They also have a Quantosaurus, a life replica, and Mudaburosaurus skeleton, and fossilized plants so you can get an idea of what the vegetation was like when these animals were alive. Some other cool ones that I don't think I've seen this in other museums, like Jobaria, the sauropod, and Afrovenador, the theropod. And they're kind of facing off against each other. Hmm. Or maybe they're friends. I don't know. <laughs> I've got some museums that have Jobaria much later in the list. <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe I'm just forgetting. Or maybe we haven't that been was, to them yet. <laughs> that's why. That's why. 
That's the first museum I've been to where I saw that one. Mm -hmm. They've also got a Dilophosaurus, which is cool because I think that was kind of community funded to get that one. And the T-Rex from T-Rex Autopsy. Oh yeah, that one's fun to see. If you haven't seen that sort of documentary-ish thing, it's really fun. They have a giant T-Rex puppet that they cut open and they're looking at the different internal organs and everything. They even added the smells. Yeah. It doesn't smell in the museum, though. No. No. I really like the eyes of the T-Rex. I think they took one of the eyes out, and it's like in a display case on its own. So you can see how big it is. It's so large. Mm -hmm. And then they've also got Winnie, the Mutaburosaurus puppet. There's a lot of mutts around on the Australian (laughs) museum. Mutaburosauruses. Yeah. Mutts. (laughs) (laughs) So going all the way to the opposite side of the earth, in Europe, there's the Natural History Museum in London. They have the holotype of Archaeopteryx. It's also known as the London specimen. It's probably the specimen that Darwin was most familiar with, and it was found just a couple years after he published On the Origin of Species, Mm -hmm. sort of validating his... Life's work. (laughs) Yeah, about like how things could evolve, and you know, it's not just about progressing towards a, a known end. It's all random and survival of the fittest and whatnot. Then you got Richard Owen in 1863, who wrote a monograph on that very same London specimen of Archaeopteryx. Partly the reason he wrote that was to argue against evolution because he did not agree with Darwin and Darwinism, (laughs) which is kind of funny that the first thing written about this Archaeopteryx holotype was somebody who was trying to disprove evolution and now it's like the prototypical evolution thing. Mm -hmm. And that's another one that you might accidentally miss, sort of like in the Melbourne Museum, Mm because it's not by the other dinosaur stuff. It's in a gallery, I think they call it the Treasures Gallery. So you go up, if you go under the big blue whale and then go up the stairs, I think it's to the right, it's in a totally separate area from the dinosaur galleries, which it just has all their really cool stuff, basically, Mm -hmm. from different collections. It's also where the holotype iguanodon teeth are. Oh, yeah. Which, you know, Iguanodon is named Iguanodon because its teeth look like a massive iguana tooth. Right. And one of the (laughs) first three dinosaurs named. Yes. And so, yeah, all the early recreations of it, of Iguanodon, were like a massive iguana. (laughs) So that's cool to see. And they also have a big jaw of, quote unquote, Dynamosaurus, which is now considered to be T-Rex, and countless other dinosaur fossils and sculptures. In London, it's definitely the number one place to go if you're looking for dinosaurs, probably really anywhere in the UK. Mm. That's where you want to be. But while you're in London, I would recommend going to the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. They are the first dinosaur sculptures ever created. Some of the first paleo outreach ever done to public outreach because they have some interesting stuff about stratigraphy in there. Outreach works as a a word there because it is (laughs) art and it's outreach. Yeah. (laughs) It was unveiled in 1854, and they're still in their original forms, like giant iguanas, like I was saying. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's what they all look like. Some of them have been going through a lot of restoration. Some of them still need some restoration. Yeah, they're out in the elements. Yeah, because they're literally just out in a park. And they're the perfect encapsulation of Victoria-era dinosaurs. And it's a nice park, so Mm -hmm. it's cool to go to. You can just take a, a subway, basically, down there. We were there in autumn and it was beautiful with the mm-hmm. changing leaves yeah yeah the people that w- we met up with there were like this is like the perfect weather this is like the prettiest it's ever been here <laughs> it's very nice <laughs> also i have to mention the oxford university museum of natural history obviously in oxford it has megalosaurus the first dinosaur ever named and the holotype is on display mm-hmm. that was named way back in 1824 so super cool they also have the sauropod cediosaurus the theropods Eustreptospondylus, Metriacanthosaurus, and Juratyrant, all of those being holotypes, mm-hmm. and the Ornithopod Cumnuria, which for a while was classified as Camptosaurus. Mm. I think that's still what the signage says, is Camptosaurus. But there's lots of other holotypes and replicas, and as a bonus, you feel like you're at Hogwarts oh, the whole yeah. time you're there. That was a fun <laughs> museum to visit. It was really cool. And it's a pretty short train ride from London. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Also, if you're there, don't miss the recreation of theropod tracks outside on the lawn. And there's also a really weird side museum that you get to by going through the Natural History Museum. It's some person's collection, and it has really unusual stuff like shrunken heads in it. Yes. So if you want to see some unusual non-dinosaur stuff, it's like just a little weird... It's very Harry Pottery. It's like, you know, the right wall, you go through this doorway <laughs> and you're in a very strange, new, different place, <laughs> like platform nine and three quarters going on. 
There's a couple really big museums in Europe that we haven't been to. One of them is the Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin, Germany, and it has dinosaurs like Giraffe Titan. Oh yeah, I want to see that one. Their mount is probably the tallest dinosaur ever mounted anywhere in the world. It's about 13 meters or 43 feet tall. I think that maybe the rearing Barosaurus in AMH might come close, but it's sort of cheating since it's rearing. <laughs> they also have their own dippy copy next to it for scale, so you can see just how much taller it is than something like a Diplodocus. Mm -hmm. The Berlin specimen of Archaeopteryx is there. It's the most complete Archaeopteryx and definitely the prettiest Archaeopteryx that's ever been found. It includes all of the claws that are prepared out really painstakingly. And those claws are really interesting because they're like in the middle of its wings, like you get with some modern birds, especially mm -hmm. when they're chicks, the little like mid claw wings at the end of their fingers. And it also has a ton of detail of the feathers. Basically, if you ever see a tattoo of Archaeopteryx or a drawing of Archaeopteryx somewhere, it's almost always based on a Berlin specimen. So that's definitely a bucket list thing we need to go see. Mm -hmm. Then there's the Naturalis Biodiversity Center in Leiden, Netherlands. They have Trix the T-Rex. I love that name, Trix. <laughs> yeah, named after Beatrix, Queen Beatrix. And not just for kids. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's one of the most complete and oldest known Tyrannosaurus specimens. It's about three quarters complete and probably about 30 years old. And they also have a rearing Camarasaurus mount and Platyosaurus, which doesn't get nearly as much love as it should. It's been getting more love. Yeah. Well, partly because of this museum. Yeah. And there are some other museums around Europe that have good Platyosaurus collections too, because there are a ton of Platyosaurus found in Europe. Mm -hmm. And then one last one I want to mention is the Natural History Museum at the University of Oslo in Norway. And that, are we partly mentioning that because we've been to that one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you wanted this one on the list and I agree with you. There's a few really cool old buildings that are sort of tied together and they have some surprisingly modern dinosaurs inside than you would expect by the architecture. Lots of feathered sculptures, including Archaeopteryx, Cynosauropteryx, which is covered in fuzz. Yeah. A really pretty Caudipteryx, which has like these really bright blue highlights. That's the one that had the fan tail, some mm -hmm. of the early evidence for that. And they recreated a fan tail. And they have this little tiny theropod that looks like it's fighting a big bug, which is also just really cool. And also an Anzu skeletal mount mm -hmm. and a cool Confucius Ornus slab. So it's really interesting. It was surprising that they had so much dinosaur stuff in Norway since Norway has virtually no Mesozoic rock. I really liked how they displayed them too. Yeah. All right, switching continents. Now we're in Asia. We've only been to museums in South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. And I'm only going to mention some of the museums that we've been to. There's a lot more. and We want to visit as many as possible. For example, there's the Central Museum of Mongolian Dinosaurs, mm -hmm. the Li Kong Tian Natural History Museum in Singapore, just to name a couple. I'll start with South Korea. The Goseong Dinosaur Museum, which maybe you've, if you follow us on Instagram, you've probably seen a lot of pictures from this one. because it was so much cool stuff. It was so pretty. Yeah. It's a really nice space. There's the museum. You can watch a film. They've got this sauropod shaped building <laughs> next to the museum. <laughs> it's sort of like the South Korean version of Drumheller with the Royal Tyrrell Museum, a I would say. A bit, yeah. I think the best part of the museum, though, is the outdoor space. You can walk around and you see these beautiful, realistic dinosaur sculptures everywhere. And I don't know, maybe it was just happened to be the day we were there. It was a little bit rainy, but the lighting was nice too. Mm -hmm. It's not all realistic though. They got some weird stuff out there. Well, yeah, <laughs> like the dinosaur shaped slides. Yeah, you come out like it's weird beak mouth <laughs> at yeah. the end of the slide. <laughs> yeah, but I like there were things like I don't know how else to explain it other than as a dinosaur cutout. Yeah, it gives you a good sense of scale. Mm -hmm. And you can also see footprints. Yeah, it's sort of all on a walkway on the way to the actual dinosaur footprints that are in situ outside. Yeah. It's not the easiest museum to get to. We rented a car and drove a couple of hours. Yeah. But it is really nice. Like It was worth the trip. It was worth the hassle for sure. And just being outdoors too. It's so serene. Yeah. They had some cool stuff inside too, all the, the typical mounts. And I think they had one of those like 4D museum I think you videos. Could, I think you could walk through a T-Rex skull too, yeah. like a replica thing. A lot of things you could walk through. Yeah. If you're in the mood for walking. Yeah. <laughs> Over in Japan, there's the Fukui Prefectural Dinosaur Museum, which is, I would 
say, one of our favorite museums. And it's one we really looked forward to seeing before we made it over there. It's also really scenic just getting there because you take a train and you see all this gorgeous scenery. Yeah. Yeah. That was amazing. It's just like a little, I think it was a one car train going through this little town and it was very idyllic and slow and just beautiful, all the rice paddies and everything. Mm-hmm. And then you get there and it's a giant building full of dinosaurs, like maybe the most dinosaurs you could fit into one giant building. It's like a massive dome. It was a crazy, the roof was probably like 300 feet tall. It was so high. Yeah. <laughs> that might be an exaggeration, but uh, it was very tall. It was very tall. <laughs> and currently the museum is under renovations. It's going to reopen this summer. But when we visited some of the highlights, there's the Therizinosaurus claw, which is just massive. Mm-hmm. There's animatronic dinosaurs, including T-Rex and Fuqui Raptor. There's a bunch of sauropods in a row, so you could easily compare their sizes. Like, And they've got Camarasaurus in there, which is, they said it was 90% original fossils in the mouth. I didn't realize that wow. when we were looking at it. Yeah. yeah. And then I think next to it, there's Apatosaurus and maybe Mementosaurus. And you can just see how different these sauropods were. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of variability in different sauropod lineages for sure. Yeah. I agree. I love it when you have similar but different dinosaurs next to each other because usually it's like, okay, well, there's one theropod and one sauropod and one ankylosaur and it's, it has that variability and it's cool. But when they're focused on one group, you can see so much cool detail. Yeah. And the dinosaur hall, it has or it had 44 full-size mounted skeletons. I don't know what it's going to look like when it's renovated, but it took us like an entire after because we wanted to take pictures of everything. And we yeah, just, basically like, the whole day. Basically the whole day, yeah. And you, we took like one picture, moved a couple inches over, next picture. <laughs> yeah, because I think like we checked out of our hotel, left our bags at the front, got on the train, went there, and then we were there until they closed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was so much to see. It was nuts how much stuff is at that museum. So cool. It's also kind of tricky to get to because the high-speed train doesn't get all the way out to Fukui, so you got to like switch trains and things. But. Right. But again, that train ride is, it was really nice, mm -hmm. that last train ride. Another museum I want to highlight from Japan is the Kitakyushu Museum of Natural History and Human History. And they have this really awesome time travel room. Yes. Which we didn't know was there at first because yeah. I don't think there was a sign pointing to it. There was a person who It was worked. in Japanese, so we it didn't know in, what it said. That's what it was. Yeah. So there was a person who was kept trying to like guide us because they knew. <laughs> they were this trying to something. wave us yeah. into this like dark hallway and we're like, we're just here for the dinosaurs. We don't need to go see what's in this random other area. Yeah. But then eventually we were persuaded and I'm so glad because that is the best part of the museum. Mm -hmm. There's it's just full of animatronic dinosaurs. They have a whole scene where they play out the end of the world when the asteroid hit. There's a whole story that goes with it. And it's all the dinosaurs and all the fauna. It's animals that lived in that area at that time in this particular area of J what is now Japan. Mm -hmm. One of the stars is Mementosaurus. And it was so impressive because it's animatronic with that gigantic <laughs> neck. Yeah. Yeah. I think they basically just created like the very front of its body, like maybe the front two legs, and then it's just neck yeah. coming out from like around a corner <laughs> and yeah. its head because it's, I don't know, dozens of feet long. It's so cool. Yeah, that was my favorite part. I agree. That was the coolest. Then in Taiwan, because we spent a lot of time in Taiwan while we were in Asia, there's the National Taiwan Museum Land Bank Exhibition Hall. And I just love that there were dinosaurs in what was a bank. Yeah. <laughs> You can go into the vault. There's not dinosaur stuff in the vault. The dinosaurs are outside. You can go into a a bank vault and see some bank science. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some old school bank museum stuff and then come out and see a ton of dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, and it includes like Tarbosaurus and Juan Titan, and they have also got this cafe with dinosaur themed foods. Mm -hmm. It's a fun place to visit. It is really cool. There's a lot of museums obviously all over Asia and especially on the mainland in China because there's a lot of new museums and museums with updated and new exhibits. And we're very fortunate. We have our listener from Beijing who has visited many of them and has kindly shared their experiences and photos. And some of the really cool sounding ones include Shandong Museum, 
Nanjing Museum of Geology and Sanya Museum of Natural History, just if you happen to be in the area and you're looking for things to see. Yeah, there are several others too that are on there, but there's just too many to name. Yes. <laughs> so many cool museums. And we haven't been to any, so we don't have too much to say about them. Yeah. Okay, speaking of places we haven't been. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of continents. Yeah. But we really, really want to go. Yeah, especially South America. We still haven't been anywhere there, and most of the websites aren't very informative, so it's tricky to see what exactly they have on display, but I did quite a bit of cyber sleuthing for a couple hours to try to <laughs> piece together which museums and which ones are the best. So I think the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil was probably the biggest dinosaur museum in South America, but unfortunately the main building burned down. A lot of the dinosaur collection wasn't destroyed, so that is still available for future museum restoration, and you know, hopefully it'll be out there soon. But for now, unfortunately, it can't be visited. Actually, I don't know if it would be the biggest dinosaur. I'm not sure how much space they dedicated to their dinosaur collections. That's always the hardest thing to tell mm -hmm. because you never know how much stuff is behind closed doors versus available for the public to see. Right. There's also the Museum of Zoology of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. They seem to have a Carnotaurus and a sauropod mounted. There have been a lot of dinosaurs discovered nearby. I'm just not sure what exactly they have on display versus what's in the collections again. But the video of the museum has a lot of clips of them pulling out preserved animals from formaldehyde jars. Oh, wow. And like, you know how they preserve yeah. random like living animals after they die in these jars? There's this video, they're like pulling out squids and like playing with their flaps. And then they're like pulling out a snake and unfurling it. I've never seen people pull these things out of the preservation jars before. Mm -hmm. And their video is like nothing but that happening. So I don't know if that's something they do all the time or they just did it for this video. But that was very unique. There's also the Bernardino Rivadavia Museum of Natural Science in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I think it's the biggest natural history museum in Argentina in terms of their collection space. They have a great collection from Patagonia. For example, the Amargosaurus holotype has a specimen number for that museum, so it must be in their collections. But I'm not, again, I'm not exactly sure what they have on display. They do have a really cool terror bird, which is technically a dinosaur. Ooh. One of those big, like, 10-foot-tall birds that, you know, had a beak for bashing into skulls, basically. Mm -hmm. And they have mounts of a couple other large dinosaurs, just not exactly sure what's going on. In order to see the really exciting stuff, though, you have to go down to Patagonia. I found a lot of details on these. All the titanosaurs. Yeah. In the Museo Carmen Funes in Nuquén, Argentina, they have the holotype of Argentinosaurus. Nice. They also have the Giganotosaurus mount and a Patagonicus, that alvarosaurid with a little tiny claw sticking out of its chest. They also have Ochosaurus, which is a close relative of Carnotaurus. And Unenlagia, the namesake of Unenlagiani, which are the South American raptors. So that's really cool to see. And quite a few other things. So that seems like a great museum. There's also the Ernesto Bachman Museum, which is also in Nuquén, Argentina. <laughs> They're so close. I believe the point of this museum is mostly to show all sorts of detail about Giganotosaurus and Carnotaurus start to finish. Oh, cool. Which is cool. It's so specifically focused. So they have recreations of the quarry sites, it looks like, for both Giganotosaurus and Carnotaurus. Then they have a mounted skeleton of each of them. And then lastly, they have completely fleshed out sculptures of each of them. So it just seems like a really cool, really specific museum that shows you two of the most popular dinosaurs that were found in the area. And you can see all this detail about them. Seems awesome. And last but not least in Argentina, there is the Egidio Ferruglio Museum in Chubut, Argentina, which was very recently remodeled, so recently that most places say, we don't have room for this, we're raising money for it, but it's clearly in there, and that is the Patago Titan. Mm. <laughs> it's a replica on the mount. I think it's the same one that they have at the Field Museum and the American Museum of Natural History, but I believe they actually have their original bones in their collections. Cool. They might also have some of the bones on display, but just not in the mount. I think it's also the most polished dinosaur-focused museum in South America since it was so recently redone. They also have a Giganotosaurus and a Tyrannotitan Chubutensis. I only mentioned the species name because it's in Chubut. Mm. It's Chubutensis. 
right next to it. And it's just like you were talking about in Fukui with the different sauropods. Tyrannotitan is a close relative of Giganotosaurus, but a little smaller. Yeah, so you can compare them. Yeah, it's so, so cool. They also have Carnotaurus in one of those cool half flesh, half skeletons and an Amargosaurus replica. Nice. And then rounding out South America, there's the INACH in Punta Arenas, Chile, which is largely Antarctica focused. Oh, okay. So you can kind of pretend like you went to an Antarctica museum without <laughs> going to Antarctica. <laughs> That's not why I have it on there. I have it on there because I believe they still have the Stego Uros tail club on display. Nice. That really crazy spiky club thing that definitely seems worth visiting if you can. And then last of the places we haven't been is Africa. For the whole continent, we only have six museums with public displays on our map. Which it's possible we're missing some. Yes. If we are, please let us know. But these are the only ones I've been able to find over the years. There's the Egyptian Geological Museum, which has some Egyptian dinosaurs. Unfortunately, most of the Egyptian dinosaurs were taken to Germany and then destroyed during World War II. Mm. But it looks like they have some pretty impressive limb bones in their cabinets, including a complete humerus of Paralatitan from the Bahari Oasis. The next one's kind of obscure, but the Red Cross building in the Lut Libya has an area of the building with some dinosaur fossils, mostly little tiny fragments, but there are also some larger pieces that are presumably from larger limb bones. <laughs> but yeah, if you're in Libya, that's the only place to go to see dinosaurs, I think. The National Baobao Hama Museum in Niamey, Niger, also has some dinosaurs. It's mostly an art and anthropology museum, but it has 60 acres of land. Wow. <laughs> and as a result, they span all sorts of different topics. They have dinosaurs in a couple different places. They have a cool history of time exhibit with a theropod mount, but they also put up a sun shading structure out over a pair of dinosaur skeletons. There's a rearing sauropod, which I don't think is Nigerosaurus since its mouth looks too rounded. That seems like the obvious choice for Niger. But I think it's actually Jobaria because oh. that's a middle Jurassic sauropod found in Niger. There's that Jobaria again. Yep. Next to it is a Suchomimus, which is sort of lunging low and forward like it's about to grab you if you're standing by. It's a really <laughs> dynamic, cool pose. And it's in a sort of similar pose to the one that's at the Children's Museum of Chicago, probably made as a pair. And Suchomimus was found in Niger, so it makes sense that they have it. At first, I thought it was a different theropod because it has a very generic theropod legs and hips. <laughs> so the first picture was mostly of the sauropod. And I was like, what's this random theropod? And then I saw the face and I was like, oh, that's a spinosaur. It's not what I was expecting. There's also the Natural History Museum of Zimbabwe in Centenary Park. It has a really cool diorama of Syntarsis. And Syntarsis was named that name because of its fused foot bones, but that was already the name of a beetle. <laughs> it was mm. invertebrate problems. So the name was changed to Megapnosaurus, which means big dead lizard. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the people that run the museum didn't like that name. I think it's hilarious. But th the museum hasn't updated it yet for what I could tell. And they're standing in a desert landscape. It's a really scraggly Triassic theropod, and it, it just looks really cool in their display. And I think that's all that's on display, but there might be some sauropod or theropod stuff too, because I know they have it in their collection since there's a lot of cool fossils in Zimbabwe. And last, there's two dinosaur museums in South Africa. There's the KwaZulu Natal Museum. They have a couple dinosaur skeletons and dioramas. It looks like it's all US stuff, unfortunately, though, like Stegosaurus, Triceratops, T Rex. But there are some smaller cases. I just can't tell what's in them. So maybe they have something local. And then last but not least, there is the Iziko. South African Museum in Cape Town. They have an exhibit called African Dinosaurs, and it has that Jobaria <laughs> mm. that we've seen elsewhere. Also the same Suchomimus that they have in Niger. And I think they also have some other smaller fossils on display. But I think if you're anywhere near any of these museums, you should definitely go to support them and try to encourage paleontology in Africa because we need more paleontology in Africa so bad. Yeah. Hopefully we can visit some of these. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed our, <laughs> what turned out to be kind of lengthy. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't talk, supposed to be so long. <laughs> talk about museums around the world. And again, yeah, check out our map. See what's near you or what might be near you when you're traveling. It's a lot of fun. And in just a second, we'll get into our dinosaur of the day, Haya. But first, we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break. 
And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Haya, which was a request from Camatorus via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. Haya was a Neo-Ornithischian, a Hypsilophodontid, that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, in the Javkalant Formation and Nemet Formation. Haya had a somewhat long body and long tail, short arms, it walked on two legs, and it had an elongate skull with a beak. There are multiple unique features found in Haya, including five, according to the original paper describing it, quote, bulbous, unserrated, premaxillary teeth. <laughs> it's like that they use the term bulbous. Bulbous teeth does sound kind of funny. Yeah. The frontals at the top of the head also, according to the paper, quote, form a remarkably flat and extensive skull table, quote. Very descriptive. Haya also had relatively wide triangular nasals. And a long, well, elongate lower jaw, the dentary, that, quote, forms over half the length of the mandible. It also had short neural arches, a gracile humerus, the arm, that in one specimen found, quote, bears evidence of scavenging. Hmm. They think that there were two holes, well, there were two holes that were probably from burrowing arthropods, and that's seen in a lot of other dinosaurs from the Gobi Desert. Haya was described by Peter Makovicki and others in 2011. They found several specimens that were well-preserved. These fossils were found between 2002 and 2007 by the Joint Mongolian Academy of Sciences and AMNH Expeditions. Speaking of AMNH, yep. yeah, they're still doing expeditions. <laughs> the holotype is a complete, quote-unquote, barely distorted skull and has parts of the spine. I like barely distorted. Yeah. It's distorted, but it's not that bad. It's pretty good. <laughs> the type species is Haya griva, and the genus and species name are, quote, from the Sanskrit for the Hindu deity Haya griva, an avatar of Vishnu characterized by a horse head in reference to the elongate and faintly horse-like skull of this dinosaur and the common depiction of this deity in the Buddhist art of Mongolia, end quote. So the name refers to Haya having that long horse-like skull. There's a lot of specimens that have been found, so we know pretty much how the whole skeleton looked. Nice. And a few of the specimens were found with a lot of gastroliths. One was described as having a, quote, sizable gastrolith mass, and it's only the second one found in ornithopods. There's one specimen with the gastroliths found near the abdomen had, quote, two tightly clustered masses of pebbles, end quote, that were probably quartz or flint. Mark Norell and Daniel Barda published in 2016 about a new highest specimen that was found in the Nemet Formation. So that's how we know it's two different formations. These fossils were found around 1992. It was a fragmentary skeleton that included the left side of the head, parts of the arm, vertebrae, and ribs. Most of the specimen was eroded, but after preparing the fossils, they found that it had a lot of similarities to Haya. So it was Haya. And in 2021, Barda and Norell published an in depth osteology of the skeleton of Haya Griva. There are a lot of referred specimens. I counted 36 in the paper that they mentioned. Wow, that is a lot. Yeah, it's enough to see a growth series. And the specimens they studied had a range of sizes, but the histology shows that they were perinatal to subadults. And there's no skeletally mature specimens. <laughs> so out of 36, they didn't get a single adult. Yes. Wow. Now, based on histology, Haya probably had a high growth rate. All the specimens sampled seemed to have been actively growing when they died. And one interesting thing is that Haya seemed to get more teeth as it grew. There were gastroliths found with multiple specimens, and the gastroliths are smooth with rounded edges. One specimen found had skull and bones that were, quote, fairly widely separated from one another, possibly dispersed by scavengers or running water, end quote. And in another case, there were two individuals found buried close to each other, along with a troodontid tooth. A lot of the bones in these specimens have holes. Again, probably from insects eating the bones after the dinosaurs died. And apparently this is very common with the dinosaurs from the Gobi. It reminds me of like movies in Egyptian settings where they have like the scarab beetles going and scavenging mm -hmm. bodies and stuff. Yeah, it's interesting to think how the insects took over mm -hmm. as soon as they could. 
<laughs> Some other animals that lived around the same time and place as Haya include the Neoceratopsian Yamaceratops, small manoraptorans, mammals, and lizards. And our fun fact of the day is that Thomas Jefferson was an amateur fossil collector. May have put Surprise. that together from earlier things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's the same Thomas Jefferson that wrote the Declaration of Independence and was the first Secretary of State, second Vice President, and third President of the U.S. According to the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University, who now have his collection, and a paper by Howard Rice, there are tons of interesting things that we know from his history. His home, nicknamed Monticello, is on the back of the U.S. nickel, so you're probably familiar with it. It's a beautiful historical plantation. But I need to acknowledge that Thomas Jefferson did enslave over 600 people throughout his life, including some of whom helped build Monticello. Oof. So there's a little bit of a blight on that. Apparently, Jefferson kept a collection of fossils in the entry hall of Monticello for visitors to enjoy. Hmm. His passion for paleontology goes way beyond that, though. So he received fossils in 1796. We rarely talk about stuff from the 1700s mm -hmm. because dinosaurs weren't dinosaurs back then. From Colonel John Stewart while vice president. Well, Jefferson was the vice president. Yes. And the colonel sent him limb bones and three large claws from a giant ground sloth. <laughs> And Jefferson published them in 1797 while still vice president, calling them giant claw, in quotes, without formally naming them. Hmm. And he did say, quote, let us say only then what we may safely say, that he was more than three times as large as the lion, end quote. <laughs> and he was right. So male lions grow up to about a quarter ton and megalonyx was about one ton. So it is less than a third the size. A lion is less than a third of the size. When the bones were formally described in 1822, it was given the name megalonyx, meaning large claw, and given the species name Jefferson Eye hmm. for obvious reasons. <laughs> Jefferson also had an impressive set of fossils from the American mastodon, as well as fossils from the ancient bison, ancient horse, Harlan's musk ox, stag moose, woolly mammoth, and of course, like all good amateur fossil collectors, he had at least one megalodon tooth. <laughs> Do we have a megalodon tooth? Uh, we don't, oh, but I, I'm not really an amateur fossil collector. Mm. We have a spinosaurus tooth. Yes, I think that's the only real fossil we have. <laughs> Some of the fossils he has came from the Lewis and Clark expeditions. So Jefferson actually was the one who organized and was president during the Lewis and Clark expeditions. The expedition went from 1803 to 1806. But most of Jefferson's collection came from the Big Bone Lick in Kentucky. Hmm. The year after Lewis and Clark got back, he sent Clark, more specifically William Clark, to Big Bone Lick just across the Ohio River from Cincinnati to collect some fossils. So it's like, oh, you spent this three-year super long journey across the West. Fetch me some fossils. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the fossils there are Pleistocene, aka Ice Age. A uh, bit new. Yeah, way too new for dinosaurs. They're estimated in this specific spot to be 18,500 years old. They have a lot of large mammals in it, like Mastodon. And that area, actually, it's kind of interesting, formed when a glacier blocked the Ohio River and flooded the area. And then all these fossilization things got cooking. William Clark found about 300 specimens. Collectively, they're known as the Clark Jefferson Collections. <laughs> Many of them eventually ended up at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, but a lot of them are also at the National Museum of Natural History in Paris. These are our ties to museums, since this is a museum episode. Yes, that's where I ran into it when I was reading about Drexel, and then I dug a little deeper, and I was like, oh, some of them are actually in Paris, too. We didn't mention that museum, because it's too many to mention. But from 1785 to 1789, Jefferson lived in Paris as the minister to France, and at the time, quote, natural history cabinets, end quote, as they called them, were very popular among amateurs, professional scientists, and even the French monarchy. He made friends with some very prominent French scientists who he stayed in touch with for years after moving back to the U.S., including while he was president. And one of the people who had one of these natural history cabinets were the French monarchy. And when the French Revolution happened, the monarchy's collection was nationalized 
into the National Museum of Natural History in Paris. Hmm. That's where uh, the, all the stuff started. Wow. Shortly after that, Jefferson was elected as a foreign associate to the National Museum of Natural History in Paris, and that was in 1801 while he was president. Interesting. In 1808, he sent a collection to Paris to them as a personal gift at his own expense, and the fossils were immediately put on display. They were mostly mastodon things, including teeth, at least one vertebra, and a really large tusk that was bigger than any of the tusks they had had up to that point. Now, there are some legends that Jefferson was the first American paleontologist or among the first American paleontologists, but this was kind of debunked by George Gaylord Simpson back in 1942. He actually wrote a paper about how Jefferson wasn't really a paleontologist. <laughs> <laughs> kind of interesting. He wrote a lot of interesting things. Like he had that novel that was published after his death. Yeah, yeah, really interesting guy. Good skeptic. But Gaylord Simpson did acknowledge that Jefferson did make some significant contributions to paleontology, although they weren't scientific contributions, basically by encouraging and funding a lot of paleontology and bringing it to the public's mm. eye. So yeah, it was really interesting. I've heard a lot about Thomas Jefferson over the years. Somehow I'd never heard that while Lewis and Clark were out on their expeditions, they found some fossils and brought them back to him or that he sent Clark <laughs> the next year <laughs> off to get more fossils for him. I didn't know about all that, but I did know he collected fossils. It's really interesting. Unfortunately, he didn't have any dinosaur fossils that I could find. Well, it was a little before anyone was talking about dinosaurs. Yeah. Lewis and Clark went through the area, though. They could have found a dinosaur fossil. They wouldn't have known it was a dinosaur. No, they wouldn't have. Before we wrap up, because this is a celebration of our eighth anniversary of the podcast, I just wanted to share some lovely testimonials we've gotten over the years. Don't worry, I won't read the whole thing, just the headlines. But uh, thank you to all of our listeners who have supported and listened to us. And, you know, you, you leave us feeling warm and fuzzy inside. I know we used to say that a lot. You could bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> so just a few headlines. And, you know, if you're listening, maybe you already agree. <laughs> We've got so much fun. Love this podcast. Must listen. Perfect for dino lovers. The quintessential dino podcast. Comprehensive, accurate, and informative. They know dino and so can you. <laughs> yeah, that's <a> fun one. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again so much for listening with us, growing with us over the years. And here's to another eight years and more. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you so much for listening. Again, you can check out our museum map on our website. That's at inodino.com. Thanks again. And until next time. Sit down,